Can I beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Platinum using only Psychic-type Pokemon? If you were a Psychic, you would know the answer to that already. But since you're not, you'll need to keep watching this video to find out. Psychic-type Pokemon are known as one of the strongest types in the franchise. Even though they're no longer as overpowered as they were in Generation 1, they are still quite good. In Sinnoh, there's a decent amount of Psychic-type Pokemon for me to use in this challenge. Unfortunately, the only one available prior to the first gym is Abra, who can't learn an attacking move. But I have a solution for that problem. As always, a full list of the rules are in the description down below, but here's a quick overview. I can only use Psychic-type Pokemon in battle, I can't overlevel my Pokemon, and battles must be on set mode. Let's get started. Ever since I was a kid, I always wanted Psychic abilities. In spite of my best efforts, I could never manifest this dream into reality. If I could, I would use them to prevent Barry from slamming into me. Sadly, I'll have to find a different way to be involved in the Psychic community. I believe my next best option is becoming a Pokemon trainer. You know what they say, those who can't do, teach. Barry tries to run into the tall grass and Professor Rowan stops him. And after some yelling and questioning, he gives us our first Pokemon. Using my totally legit version of Pokemon Platinum, I replace Piplup with Mime Jr. It was tough deciding on what Pokemon made the most sense to start with, so I figured choosing the baby Pokemon would be pretty fair. I also decided to give Barry Turtwig, as it'll eventually evolve into a Torterra, which will know Crunch. Although, I could have made a strong case for Empoleon as well. Once I defeat Barry, I return home, and instead of grounding me for doing what she explicitly asked me not to do, my mom tells me I should go off on my own Pokemon adventure. Clearly, she's had enough of my sh**. My Mime Jr. happens to be female, which I wasn't aware was possible, as they eventually evolve into Mr. Mime, but who am I to judge our non-binary starter? I just hope they live a long and happy life. What will help her live a long and happy life is the fact that she has a rash nature, which is plus special attack and minus special defense, and the filter ability. I honestly had never considered the possibility of getting a Mime Jr. with the filter ability. I just assumed it was going to be soundproof. This is incredibly lucky, as Filter is an excellent ability. Barry has me lead him to the lake where Cyrus is staring off into the distance and talking to himself, which is perfectly normal behavior and not at all a red flag. I head over to Sand Gem Town and get to nickname Mime Jr., so I name her Marianne. I meet up with Dawn in Jubilife City and... Um... Okay, this region is full of weirdos. I head east and Barry challenges me to a rematch. Marianne is able to handle his team with ease with the help of a timely crit. I make it to Orberg City and here I can get an important item, a Dusk Ball. The reason I'm starting this run at night is, well, it's, it's because I have insomnia, but it's also because back on Route 203 I can encounter an Abra. For any of you who have played a Nuzlocke before, you know just how difficult it is to catch an Abra with a Pokeball if you don't have any status moves to prevent it from teleporting. A Dusk Ball at least gives me a chance. I finally find one and throw the ball, and manage to catch it. If this didn't work out, I would be able to get a Kadabra later on, but having him now is great. I name him Alec, and he has a gentle nature, which is plus special defense and minus defense. Not bad, although now he's even more frail when it comes to physical attacks. I decide to switch train him and Marianne against Wild Zubat and Ponyta north of Orberg for speed EVs. Then I get ready to take on the first gym. Marianne's special attacks will do well against the Rock-type Pokemon, but her low defense still makes this a challenge. I was hoping her Geodude would go for Stealth Rock here so I can use Encore and then set up some barriers to raise our defense, but Confusion manages to almost knock it out and confuses it, and then he hurts himself in Confusion and knocks himself out. I guess the silver lining here is that Marianne is still at full HP for Kranidos, which has a very high attack stat and knows Pursuit. Confusion does over half, and thanks to Filter, Marianne takes a bit less damage from Pursuit, but it still brings her to below half as well. Rourke heals and two more Confusions are able to knock out Kranidos. Last is Onyx. Confusion does over half, and Onyx just goes for Stealth Rock, although with its pathetic attack stat, Marianne could have lived a rock throw. A second Confusion takes it out, earning us the first badge. Back in Jubilife, I run into Professor Rowan, who is absolutely roasting this Galactic Grunt. Normally, this isn't a battle worth covering. Although, if you've seen my Poison-type Nuzlocke of Platinum, you'll know this battle has claimed a life before. 
The reason I'm talking about this is because one of the grunts has a stunky, which is dark type. Because I'm not a psychic, I didn't foresee this battle being an issue, nor did I see the need to teach Marianne double slap at level 15. The only damaging move I have is confusion, so I'm gonna need Dawn to take care of it with Chimchar, otherwise I'm doomed. The battle starts with her Chimchar being crit, which is very bad for me. Marianne takes out Glammeow with confusion, and fortunately Dawn's Chimchar is able to stay alive and eventually take down Stunky. That would have been a very depressing way to lose a run. On the way to Floroma, with the level cap at 22, I can evolve Alec into Kadabra. At the Valley Windworks, I defeat the Galactic Grunt and he runs inside. And in order to get the key, I need to defeat two more Grunts, one of whom also has a Stunky. This time though, I don't have Dawn to carry me across the finish line. Before the battle, I'm able to get Marianne to level 18 where she learns Mimic, which allows her to evolve into Mr. Mime. My solution to the Grunt problem is pretty unfortunate, as I have to teach Alec the move Return. It doesn't do much damage, then he gets hit with Screech, lowering his already low defense. He then gets hit with Fury Swipes, and if that had hit 5 times, he was done for, as 3 brings him to just 13 HP. A third return doesn't do enough, and thankfully Stunky just goes for another Screech, and Alec is able to get the KO. That was lucky. For anyone who wants to try this run for themselves, I recommend teaching your Mime Jr. Double Slap. That isn't even the difficult part of dealing with Team Galactic, as back at the Valley Windworks, I have to take on Commander Mars and her Perugly. She leads with Zubat, which goes down to a confusion. Unfortunately, even with the speed EVs, Marianne still can't outspeed. Perugly hits with Fake Out, then Faint Attack takes Marianne to just 21 HP before her Orenberry heals her. Confusion does just under half, but comes up clutch and confuses Perugly. She then hits herself in Confusion, which activates her Citrus Berry, but a second Confusion brings her to the red. Marianne avoids a critical hit from Faint Attack and finishes it off with another Confusion. I didn't really have a great plan for that battle, but with a little luck, we're able to get the win. After reuniting this little girl with her father, she says, I think the Balloon Pokemon will come visiting again. Wait a second. Balloon Pokemon? Uh-oh. In Eterna Forest, I team up with Cheryl and then make it through to Eterna City. This is where there are quite a few possible new team members, as over on Route 211, I can catch one of Bronzor, Chingling, or Ametitite. And in Mount Coronet, I have a second chance at those same three Pokemon. On Route 211, I run into a Bronzor that I named Brawny. They also have a gentle nature, but unfortunately have the heat proof ability instead of levitate. Then I head into Mount Coronet and run into a Chingling that I named Bella. She has a bold nature, which is plus defense and minus attack. Pretty solid. This means I won't be able to catch a Metatite for quite a while, but that's okay. Next up is the second gym against Gardenia and her grass type Pokemon. She leads with Turtwig and I send in Marianne. Confusion does over half as Turtwig unfortunately sets up a sunny day. This will make her Cherum a bit more difficult to deal with. Fortunately at level 22, Marianne learns both Light Screen and Reflect, so I set up a Light Screen as she goes for a Safeguard. I then lock Cherum into Safeguard with Encore, and take it down with a couple of Confusions thanks to a crit and the Sunlight fading. Her Roserade comes in and it's weak to Psychic type moves, but has a pretty good special defense, so Confusion takes it into Berry range. Marianne then gets paralyzed with Stun Spore as our Light Screen fades. Roserade hits pretty hard with Grass Knot, then Marianne gets fully paralyzed. I swap into Alec, who gets hit way harder than I thought with a Grass Knot, but fortunately he's able to outspeed and on the next turn, take it down with Confusion. That was a little more dicey than I anticipated, but a win is a win, and we've got our second badge. Gardenia is just the warm-up fight though, as the true challenges in this run come from the Galactic Leaders. In order to deal with Jupiter and her Night Slashing Skun Tank, I head over to the old chateau and get TM90, Substitute. With that, I walk into the Galactic Hideout, and when I walk in, I'm stopped by a Grunt that happens to just be Looker in disguise. This man then proceeds to get out of his disguise right in front of everyone, but somehow no one notices. I clear through the seemingly oblivious Grunts and make my way up to the top floor where Jupiter and her Skun Tank await. I think I have a decent plan here, but it's going to rely on a bit of luck. She leads with Zubat, and I send in Brawny. I need to put it to sleep with Hypnosis, but unfortunately Brawny misses. A second connects though, so I send in Alec, who I've taught Substitute. Fortunately Zubat stays asleep, and he can take it out with Confusion on the next turn. 
Her skun tank comes in and I get to use a move that I have never once used in my life, Miracle Eye. With Miracle Eye, I'm able to remove skun tank's immunity to psychic type moves. Our substitute breaks after being hit with a Night Slash, but unfortunately, Confusion isn't a one-hit KO, and Alec has no chance of living a Night Slash. I have to rely on 80% accurate Disable in hopes of being able to survive, otherwise Alec is done for. Thankfully he connects, and then he's able to knock it out with two Confusions. If Disable had missed, I might be talking about Attempt 2 by now. After defeating Team Galactic, I head to the bike shop, and then I'm stopped by Cynthia. Oh. You were looking for me, huh? You've got something nice for me? <laughs> well, I've got something nice for- Oh, an egg? Haha, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what I meant too. Because I'm, I'm a psychic trainer. I knew that's what you were coming here to do. I certainly wasn't having any intrusive thoughts. <clears throat> Thanks for the egg. I head into Mount Coronet and Cyrus appears once again and starts talking to me as if we were in the middle of a conversation and we've known each other for years. Master of everybody, you couldn't stand it so you had to turn everybody against me. Dude, listen to yourself. Nobody turned anybody against you. I mean, you were never that cool to begin with. <laughs> Seriously, man, he would just come around saying weird sh about being a golden god or some other insane crap and referring to all of us as your minions. Over on Route 208, there's another potential encounter, a Ralts. Although, like Abra, it does have teleport, so it's not a guarantee that I'll be able to catch it. After running around for a while, I finally run into one, and I throw a great ball and manage to catch it before it runs away. This one happens to be a male, so I'll be able to evolve him into a Gallade, which is pretty great. I name him Gavin, and he also has a gentle nature. Man, this team is vulnerable to physical attacks. In Hard Home City, in the house next to the Pokemon Center, Bebe gives me an Eevee that I name Sunny. He has a hasty nature, which is plus speed and minus defense. The speed is great, but that's four team members with a minus defense nature now. After cycling back and forth, not only am I ready for a cycling marathon, but I'm also ready to evolve Sunny into an Espeon. I also evolved Gavin into Curlia. Neither of them will be all that helpful for the next gym though, which is a battle against Fantina and her ghost types. This battle is pretty tough regardless, but having a team full of Pokemon weak to Ghost-type moves makes this a daunting task. She leads with Duskull, and I send out Brawny. Brawny actually outspeeds and lands an extra sensory before being burned. A second extra sensory gets a flinch, then she goes for Shadow Sneak, and Brawny lands a Hypnosis. I needed Duskull to be asleep and damaged, so I can send out Marianne, who can set up a light screen, then finish it off with Psybeam, which wouldn't have been able to knock it out in one hit. Ms. Magius comes out and hits with Shadow Ball, which still does decent damage even through the light screen and with the filter ability, but it gets a special defense drop, which is brutal. Psybeam does just under half, and now thanks to the lowered special defense, Shadow Ball takes Marianne to just 16 HP before her berry, then Psybeam activates her Citrus Berry. Now she can't survive another Shadow Ball, so I have to swap into Alec, who's able to avoid a critical hit. Alec can outspeed, but Psybeam isn't going to do enough to KO, so I have to risk another miss with Disable, but thankfully it connects and Disable Shadow Ball. Fantina is going to heal here, and two Psybeams take her down to like 2 HP, but fortunately her Psybeam doesn't do enough to take out Alec, and he's able to knock it out on the next turn. Haunter comes in, and thankfully this thing doesn't know Sucker Punch, so Alec is able to outspeed and knock it out with Psybeam, earning us the third badge. After defeating Fantina, Barry tries to rely on the element of surprise in order to finally win a battle against us. It doesn't take a psychic to foresee this strategy not paying off for him. Marianne is able to take out his entire team with a handful of Psybeams thanks to a crit against his Staravia. Next, I pass through Salacian Town, head through Route 215, and make it to Veilstone City, the home of the fourth gym. Before taking on Maylene, I head south of Veilstone to the Valor Lakefront for my next encounter, a Giraffe Rake. Having a Pokemon that's part normal type sure would have been nice for the Ghost Gym. I catch him and I name him George. He has a careful nature which is plus special defense and minus special attack. Not very good. Because it's now nighttime, I can evolve Bella into a Chimeco just in time for the next gym. As you can probably imagine, the fighting type gym isn't exactly the toughest part of this run. That doesn't mean Maylene's Lucario can't cause some issues though. She leads with Metatite and I lead with Marianne. Psybeam is able to knock it out in one shot, and Machoke comes in. He too goes down to a single Psybeam. So far, so good. Lucario comes in, so I swap into Brawny on a Metal Claw. 
Then, anticipating a bone rush, I swap to Bella, who has Levitate, but she just goes for Force Palm instead, which crits. Maylene's luck runs out immediately, though, as her Lucario misses a Metal Claw. Then Bella lands a Yawn. I know Bella can survive even a critical hit here, but it's still scary watching her take yet another critical hit from Metal Claw and survive at just 2 HP. Even when you know you're going to be fine, watching their health get that close to zero still gives me anxiety. She hits a Confusion, and Lucario goes to sleep. I swap back into Marianne and hit a Psybeam, which doesn't do quite enough for the KO. Lucario then wakes up and hits a Metal Claw, which gets the attack boost, but it's too late, as one more Psybeam earns us the victory. As I exit the gym, Dawn asks me to help her get her Pokedex back from Team Galactic. After defeating the Grunts, Looker shows up, and once he's done being weird, I pick up the HM for Fly, then head down to Pastoria, where I can make some serious upgrades to the team. West of the city, I can find a hidden Dawnstone, which allows me to finally evolve Gavin into a Gallade. Then, over at the Move Tutor, I can trade a Heart Scale to teach him Leaf Blade just in time for the Water-type gym. With the level cap at 37, I'm also able to evolve Brawny into a Bronzong. Before the gym, Barry once again tries to sneak up on me in hopes of gaining some sort of edge in battle. His Staravia goes down in one hit from Shockwave from Alec, as does Buizel. He sends in Grotl, who would probably be fully evolved by now if Barry spent more time worrying about his Pokemon and less time worrying about trying to sneak up on me. I swap to Brawny as his Grotl now knows Bite, and they're the only one that can reasonably tank a hit from it. Brawny then misses a Hypnosis, but he just goes for Withdraw and a second hypnosis puts it to sleep. After an extra sensory does about a third, Grotl immediately wakes up and goes for withdraw again. A second extra sensory gets a flinch because somehow he managed to find the one Pokemon slower than Bronzong in all of Sinnoh. A third extra sensory takes out Grotl, and he sends in his last Pokemon, Ponyta. Even though Brawny has heatproof, I decide it's time to get Sunny into a battle, as he's been a bit bored sitting in the back of the party, and he finally knows a useful move in Psybeam. One Psybeam just misses a KO, but after tanking a Stomp, a second finishes off Ponyta. Barry then runs off, and before taking on Crasher Wake, I'm going to evolve Alec into an Alakazam. Before I do, I was looking at my team and man, Alec has a defense stat of only 26 at level 35. If he so much as stubs his toe, it might be enough for a one-hit KO. But, as an Alakazam, he should be able to outspeed and one-shot a lot of his opponents. At least, I hope so, because up next is Crasher Wake. Two of his three team members know the move Bite, and both Gyarados and Floatzel are fast and hit hard. Then there's his Quagsire, who's trying his best. According to my calcs, Shockwave has a 62.5% chance to knock out Gyarados in one hit. If it doesn't, Alec is done for. I don't really have a ton of great options, so for the sake of content, let's gamble. I send in Alec and I go for Shockwave and... Oh. It crit. Well, that works I guess. Floatzel comes in, and since it isn't four times weak to electric moves, Shockwave definitely won't KO. So I swap into Brawny, who gets hit with a crunch, then it gets the defense drop. A second brings Brawny into Citrus Berry range now, but fortunately they land the 60% accurate Hypnosis on the first try. With Floatzel asleep, I set up Reflect. Then I switch into Gavin as Floatzel stays asleep. It outspeeds, but stays asleep again, and Leaf Blade gets the KO. Last up is Quagsire, and this poor little guy doesn't stand a chance against another Leaf Blade from Gavin. Sorry, buddy. With that, Crasher Wake is defeated. As I exit the gym, Barry shows back up and tells us that he heard a Team Galactic member mention a bomb. This is clearly an emergency. We all run to try and stop the bomb and... Um... Not now, Barry. The bomb then explodes, and after I chase down the Grunt and defeat him, my queen Cynthia shows up. We're deep in conversation and... Damn it! Not now, Barry! Now that the moment is ruined, she sends me on an errand to clear a path on Route 210 that's blocked by some Psyduck. Once the path is clear, she asks if I can deliver something to her grandmother in Celestic Town, and tells me that there are rare Pokémon between here and there. I don't know about rare, but I do know my next encounter lies just up ahead. A Metatite that I missed out on getting earlier. I catch her, and I name her Lisa. She has a lonely nature, which is plus attack and minus defense, which is pretty good, although that's what, five minus defense natures now? I'm sure that won't become an issue later on. I evolve her into a Metacham and continue through the fog and get the TM for Shadow Ball. I make it out of the fog unscathed and get to Celestic Town. I deliver the old charm to Cynthia's grandmother. Then in the ruin, Cyrus shows up and finally wants to battle instead of saying something weird and walking away like he usually does. He leads with Sneasel and I send out Lisa. 
Sneasel outspeeds and lands a pretty hard Ice Punch, but she hits harder with a 4x super effective Force Palm for the KO. Golbat comes in, so I swap into Alec, who is now equipped with the choice specs that I got from a guy in Celestic Town. Golbat misses Air Cutter on the switch, then Alec is able to take out both Golbat and Murkrow in one hit from Shockwave. Eventually, Cyrus and his Dark-type Pokémon are going to be a lot more of a threat. With the Surf HM from Cynthia's grandmother, I can now get some great items from around Sinnoh that would have been a lot more helpful earlier like the Thunderbolt TM. I can now surf over to Candelave City, where yet again Barry is waiting to battle me. This time around his team has fully evolved. He leads with Staraptor, so I send out Alec, who can knock it out in one hit with Choice Specs boosted Psybeam. Heracross comes in, but also goes down to a single Psybeam. Floatzel comes in, and unlike Crash or Wake, his only knows Pursuit, and it doesn't add speed, so it too goes down to a Psybeam. Torterra comes in, and it knows Bite, so I swap into Brawny, but he just misses a Razor Leaf instead. After a bite, Brawny misses a Hypnosis. And after a second bite doesn't flinch, Brawny lands a Hypnosis, then sets up a Reflect. Torterra stays asleep as I swap into Lisa, who now knows Ice Punch thanks to the move relearner in Pastoria. Ice Punch easily deals with Torterra, then his Rapidash comes in. Lisa outspeeds the Fiery Horse and lands a critical hit from Force Palm for the KO. Lisa hasn't been here long, but she's already a star. After a quick trip to Iron Island and clearing out the trainers in the gym, I'm ready to take on Byron. He leads with Magneton, so I send in Lisa, who is able to knock it out with a Force Palm. Steelix comes in, and thanks to its massive defense, it isn't a one-hit KO, so I send in Bella, who avoids an Earthquake with Levitate. Bella goes for Yawn, and Steelix sets up a Sandstorm. I go for Confusion until Steelix falls asleep, so I can swap back into Lisa. This isn't the best strategy, as obviously Steelix can just wake up, but at least it makes things a bit safer. Force Palm takes it to the red, and Steelix stays asleep. Byron uses a full restore, but two more Force Palms are able to take down Steelix. Bastiodon comes in, but thanks to its 4 times weakness to Fighting-type moves, a Force Palm is able to get the KO and earn us the 6 badge. After exiting the gym, Barry drags me to a place almost as bad as Pokestar Studios, the library. I'm asked to head over to Lake Valor, and when I arrive, I find Team Galactic there committing environmental crimes. Commander Saturn then challenges me to a battle. Her Golbat stands no chance against a Psychic from Alec. Her Bronzor, however, does, as Psychic obviously doesn't do much to it. I swap to Lisa, who is able to knock it out from there with a Force Bomb. She sends in Toxicroak, so I swap into Brawny on a Poison Jab. Brawny then outspeeds as she was clearly going for revenge, but a 4x super effective extra sensory knocks it out in one hit. I head back over to Lake Verity and defeat the Grunts, then have a rematch with Commander Mars. This time, I lead with Lisa versus her Golbat, and an Ice Punch is able to knock it out. Before this battle, I had gone back to Pastoria to teach Lisa Fire Punch so I can deal with her Bronzor, as well as the upcoming Ice-type gym. Her Perugly comes in and hits a Fake Out, then it hits a Slash, which in hindsight could have crit and taken out Lisa. Fortunately, I'm unpunished for my laziness, and it's Lisa who lands a crit with a Force Palm to knock out her Perugly. With those two out of the way, I'm asked to go check on Barry up at Lake Acuity, so I head through Mount Coronet to one of my favorite routes in all of Pokémon, the Snow-Covered Route 217. I finally get to Lake Acuity and find Barry standing at the top of the rocks. He proceeds to mock me about being too slow. Okay, buddy. You haven't even been able to knock out a single one of my Pokémon, so maybe pump the brakes on the arrogance. I head over to the Snowpoint City Gym to take on Candace, and her team can be a bit tricky. Her Frostlass in particular knows Shadow Ball and Double Team, and if her Obama Snow comes in to set up Hail, its evasiveness will be increased due to the Snow Cloak ability. I think I've got a decent plan on how to deal with her, though. She leads with Sneasel, which would be a problem for the team if not for Brawny. After tanking a feint attack, Brawny responds with a Gyro Ball and knocks it out. Piloswan comes in, so I swap into Bella, anticipating an Earthquake. I go for Yawn, but her Piloswan unfortunately set up Hail. I go for Reflect, which prevents Stone Edge from doing much damage. Piloswan falls asleep, and I set up a Light Screen as well. Then I switch to Lisa as Piloswan wakes up and hits a weak Stone Edge. Force Palm is then able to knock it out in one hit. Pure Power is such a good ability. Perfect timing as her Frostlass comes in, but the hail stopped. She tries to go for Double Team, but Lisa has no time for this nonsense, and hits a Fire Punch for a KO. Fortunately, Lisa's Ghost-type weakness baited out Frostlass before Obama Snow, who comes in last and is easily knocked out with a 4 times super effective Fire Punch to earn us the 7th badge. Now that I've got the 7th badge, I can use Rock Climb and get up to Lake Acuity, only to find Barry being ridiculed by Commander Jupiter. I would feel bad for him, but he kind of deserves it. 
Back in Veilstone, I head over to the Galactic HQ, and Looker shows up again and finally does something useful and opens the gate in the warehouse. After getting the Galactic Key, I head back into the Galactic HQ and find Looker. Then we watch Cyrus deliver a speech in the same style that a fascist tyrant would. Then I head upstairs so I can tell Cyrus that his speech sucked. He doesn't seem to appreciate the feedback, so he challenges me to another battle. He leads with Sneasel, and I send out Brawny, who gets hit with a Screech before landing a Gyro Ball, which doesn't do enough to knock it out, but forces him to use a Hyper Potion. A second Screech is a bit concerning, but Brawny still tanks an Ice Punch well in spite of being at minus 4 defense, and finishes it off with a Gyro Ball. Crobat comes in, and I figured I have one chance to land a Hypnosis before I'm forced to switch out due to the defense drops. Crobat goes for Confuse Ray, but Brawny breaks through and then connects and puts it to sleep. This allows me to switch into Lisa, and fortunately, Crobat never wakes up, and goes down to an Ice Punch. I've had some pretty good luck with Hypnosis this run. Punch Crow comes in and would be a massive threat, but thankfully Lisa is faster, and an Icicle Plate boosted Ice Punch is able to get the KO. The first two battles with Cyrus have gone pretty smooth, but his team gets a massive upgrade between now and the next time we meet. Up ahead, I find the three legendary lake Pokemon being held captive. In order to save my psychic friends, I've got to deal with Saturn again. She doesn't put up much of a fight though, so I'm able to free the legendary trio. Unfortunately, I now have to chase Team Galactic up a mountain, and I have to bring a B-barrel for all of the HM moves that I need to get to the top, so I won't be at full strength for the most important battles of the run so far. On the way, I run into Looker who says, Observe, if you will, that hole. Um, thanks, I guess. At the top of Mount Coronet, I've got a double battle with Mars and Jupiter, but fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, Barry shows up to join me. They lead with two Bronzors, and I lead with Lisa, who takes out the Bronzor that knows Reflect with a Fire Punch. The other sets up a light screen, and it's honestly not worth talking about whatever Barry and his Munchlax are doing. Golbat comes in and goes down to an Ice Punch. Skuntank comes in and Force Palm does just over half and gets the Paralysis. Fortunately, they seem determined to attack Barry's Munchlax, although Bronzor confuses Lisa with Confuse Ray. Now that she's confused, I swap to Brawny. Brawny manages to outspeed, so Gyro Ball clearly does nothing here. So on the next turn, I put the Bronzor to sleep so it doesn't keep using Confuse Ray on my Pokemon. Barry's Munchlax finally faints, so something useful comes in, as Rapidash takes out Skuntank with a Fire Blast as I set up a light screen with Brawny. Now in a 2v1, I switch back to Lisa as Rapidash hits another Fire Blast, but thanks to the light screen, it doesn't do much. Then Lisa gets confused again. I swap into Gavin, and this time Rapidash hits a third Fire Blast in a row. Then Gavin knocks it out with a Leaf Blade. Her Ugly comes in and hits hard with Shadow Claw, but Drain Punch is able to knock it out in one hit and heal Gavin back to almost full health. If Barry would lead with literally any of his other Pokemon other than Munchlax, he wouldn't be so useless. Cyrus then opens portals to different dimensions, which seems a bit unsafe, but you do you, King. My legendary psychic friends show up, and then a giant black hole opens from the ground, and a shadowy monster emerges. And Cyrus doesn't seem to be scared at all by this, which seems crazy, because that would terrify the shit out of me. Before heading into the distortion world, I make sure the team is ready. Then Cynthia and I jump into the void together. This isn't where I imagined our first date to be. I chase down Cyrus and get challenged to the most terrifying battle in the run so far. He leads with a Houndoom, and fortunately Lisa is able to outspeed it, so I lead with her and she takes it out with a Force Palm. Honchkrow comes in next, and this thing is a massive threat, but Lisa can once again outspeed and take it out with an Icicle Plate boosted Ice Punch. Crobat comes in, but this time it won't be a one-hit KO, so I swap into Brawny who gets hit with a Confuse Ray. Fortunately, they break through once again, and land a Hypnosis on the first try again. Brawny breaks through Confusion again and sets up a Reflect, which will last longer thanks to a Held Light Clay. This allows me to swap into Marianne for a Choice Specs boosted Thunderbolt as Crobat stays asleep. Weavile comes in, and this is his biggest threat by far, as it outspeeds everyone on the team and it has Night Slash. I send Brawny back in who takes a Fake Out. Then Night Slash does minimal damage thanks to Reflect. Once again, Brawny hits a Hypnosis on the first try. Then a Gyro Ball does about two-thirds and activates his Citrus Berry. A second Gyro Ball does enough to take it out. Last in is Gyarados, who hits an Earthquake, but thanks to Reflect, Brawny is able to survive and, yet again, land a Hypnosis. Marianne comes in and Gyarados stays asleep, and she knocks it out with a Thunderbolt. When I decided to do this run, I thought for sure I was going to lose a Pokémon to Cyrus in the Distortion World. Now that our date is ruined, Cynthia heals my Pokémon and tells me to meet Giratina. 
I stare into the eyes of the ghostly beast, and they stare back at me. I do my best not to soil myself, then I run away. Now that Team Galactic is defeated, the path to Sunny Shore City is no longer blocked, and I can finally head over and take on the final gym. I have to convince Volkner to go back to the gym, and he tells me that he's the toughest gym leader in all of Sinnoh. Uh, I don't know about that one, buddy. Normally, I can sweep through his entire team with an Earthquake user, and fortunately Gavin can learn the TM that I got from inside the Hidden Cave. Unfortunately, Gavin won't be able to outspeed all of his Pokémon. His Jolteon has Thunder Wave, and without holding Soft Sand, Gavin can't quite one-hit KO the Electivire, so I can't give him a Cherry Berry to heal the Paralysis. I do have a solution to this problem, though. This whole time, George has been waiting patiently for his time to shine, sitting in the box, dreaming of his moment that he can join the team. This is your moment, buddy. I lead with George against Jolteon, and he gets hit with Thunder Wave, and I intentionally don't have a berry equipped, as it's important that Jolteon no longer attempts to go for another Thunder Wave. George goes for Agility, then after Jolteon misses a Charge Beam, George uses Baton Pass and I switch into Gavin. With the Agility boost, Gavin can now outspeed everyone on Volkner's team. An Earthquake takes out Jolteon, then Electivire comes in. Gavin is able to knock it out in one hit with Earthquake as well. Luxray comes in and fortunately it doesn't have Intimidate. I go for another Earthquake and somehow he lives on 1 HP, then hits a Thunderfang which does massive damage. A crit definitely would have knocked out Gavin here, and fortunately it doesn't paralyze him either. According to my calcs, Earthquake is a guaranteed one hit KO, which means his Luxray had to have had a plus defense nature, then survived at exactly 1 HP. In spite of that terrible luck, Gavin is able to knock it out after Volkner heals, with a Drain Punch and an Earthquake. His last Pokemon is Raichu, but thanks to the heal from Drain Punch, Quick Attack won't be able to knock Gavin out, even if it crits. Which, of course, it does. Gavin survives at 21 HP, and finishes off Raichu. That got a lot more dicey than I was expecting, but with that victory, I've got all 8 badges, and now it's time to head to Victory Road and the Elite Four. Nothing too eventful happens in Victory Road, so let's skip ahead to the last rival battle with Barry. Marianne is able to one-shot Staraptor with Thunderbolt. Heracross comes in and is also a one-hit KO with Psychic. Floatzel comes in, but since Barry is underleveled here, Marianne outspeeds and takes it out with Thunderbolt as well. Snorlax comes in and this thing is actually a bit of a problem, so I send in Brawny anticipating a crunch, but he goes for Body Slam instead, which gets the paralysis. This is far from ideal, as Snorlax also knows Earthquake. Now I have to send in Bella in hopes of avoiding an Earthquake, but he once again goes for Body Slam, which does a ton of damage. I set up Reflect and Snorlax goes for Crunch, which Bella tanks reasonably well. I send in Lisa on what I'm hoping is another Crunch, which it is. Then Force Palm does enough to get the KO. The reason I needed to set up Reflect was because if Lisa took too much damage, Rapidash could KO with a critical hit Fire Blast. Rapidash comes in and Force Palm barely misses a KO, but fortunately she just misses a Will-O-Wisp and goes down on the following turn. Last is Torterra, but once again a 4 times super effective Ice Punch gets the KO. Now that Barry is finally out of the way, I can focus on the real challenge ahead, the Elite Four. Let's take a look at the team. I seriously considered bringing Bella along with me specifically to deal with ground-type moves, but ultimately I decided against it. Sonny hasn't done a whole lot of anything in this run, but this is his moment. I settled at level 58 because being at level 59 from the start felt a little too overpowered for some of the weaker Elite Four members. Although I do have rare candies in the bag to make sure everyone is at level 59 by the time I get to Cynthia. That's enough stalling, let's do this. First up is Aaron. Normally not a big threat, but his Bug-type Pokémon and Dark-type Drapion present a challenge right away. Yanmega can't outspeed Lisa until its speed boost ability activates, so it goes down to a single Ice Punch. Drapion comes in next, and I know it's going for Aerial Ace, so I swap into Brawny to tank it. Brawny then tanks an X-Scissor, then sets up Reflect, which will last longer due to a held Light Clay. Another X-Scissor doesn't do much, then Brawny once again lands a Hypnosis on the first try. What a legend. I swap into Gavin as Drapion stays asleep for two turns. Then Gavin hits an Earthquake and just misses a KO. But fortunately the Citrus Berry heal prevents Aaron from using a full restore, and Drapion stays asleep, so Gavin can finish it off on the following turn. Heracross comes in, but like berries, it can't handle the power of our Psychic-type moves, and goes down to a Psycho Cut. Vespaquin comes out, so I switch back into Brawny, but unfortunately she goes for Defense Order. Brawny hits another Hypnosis on the first try, and then Reflect wears off, so I set up another and Vespaquin stays asleep. An Ice Punch brings it low, and apparently getting punched still isn't enough to wake up the Sleeping Queen, and she goes down to a Fire Punch. 
Last up is Scizor, but his 4 times weakness to fire makes Fire Punch an easy one hit KO. One down. Next up is Bertha, and I would love to use Gavin to sweep her whole team with Leaf Blade, but her Gliscor not being weak to grass moves makes that a bit difficult. From here on, this is Sunny's team. I taught him Grass Knot, and with the Choice Specs attached, he easily knocks out Whiskash. Leading with Sunny instead of Gavin brings out Hippowdon, as it knows Crunch, which allows Sunny to stay in and knock it out with Grass Knot as well. As you can imagine, the very heavy rock Pokemon Rhyperior stands no chance here. Then Gliscor comes in. The only downside of my plan is there isn't a safe way to set up Reflect. In hindsight, I should have led with someone like Marianne and used one of the many Reflect TMs I have in my bag, and given her the Light Clay. Because at the time I didn't have the power of hindsight, I instead need to hope that Lisa can avoid being crit by an earthquake. Sometimes in life, you just need to live on the edge. Lisa comes in and Gliscor goes for Earthquake, and no critical hit. Lisa then outspeeds and takes it down with Ice Punch. Golem comes in, and unfortunately I have to take on the same risk as before, as Gavin now has to avoid a critical hit from Earthquake. Once again I manage to avoid disaster, and then a Leaf Blade takes down Golem for the win. If you're going to try this run for yourself, I highly recommend simply being better than me at the game, and getting a Levitate Bronzong instead of a Heatproof one, that way you can safely set up Reflect. No offense, Bronny. Third is Flint, the Fire-type trainer. While I think his team is pretty cool, he's usually one of the easier members as long as you have a Pokemon with Surf or Earthquake that can outspeed his Pokemon. Because I don't, I actually have to use my brain for once. He leads off with Houndoom, so I send in Gavin, who can outspeed and KO with an Earthquake. Unfortunately, Gavin isn't faster than a few of his other team members, so when Rapidash comes in, I anticipate a bounce, so I swap to Brawny. Rapidash just goes for Sunny Day, though, so Gavin could have stayed in and used Earthquake. On the next turn, he goes for Bounce, so I set up Stealth Rock, which I'm going to need for Magmortar. Bounce connects and doesn't paralyze. Then, you guessed it, Brawny lands another Hypnosis. This allows me to send in Sunny as he can actually outspeed the rest of Flint's team. A Choice Specs boosted Psychic knocks out Rapidash. Then Infernape comes in and meets a similar fate. Flareon comes in and my superior Evolution wins the fight. The reason I needed Stealth Rock damage was because Psychic wasn't quite a one-hit KO on Magmortar, and Gavin couldn't outspeed the Infernape, but Sunny can, and a Psychic knocks it out and earns us the victory. Three down. At last, I finally arrived at the fourth member of the Elite Four, Lucian, my true rival in Sinnoh. It's time to see which one of us is truly a Psychic Master. Spoiler alert, it's me. Well, it's actually Sunny. Sunny waited patiently for this moment, sitting out important battles throughout the entire run, and now that he's got an opportunity, he's going to make the most of it. Choice Specs boosted Shadow Ball easily knocks out Mr. Mime. Lucian sends out his lesser Espeon, and it too falls to a Shadow Ball. Bronzong isn't going to be a one-hit KO, but Shadow Ball gets the special defense drop, which is great because Bronzong goes for Calm Mind. That allows a second Shadow Ball to still do enough damage to knock it out. Gallade isn't quite a one-hit KO though, thanks to its massive special defense. Its Citrus Berry activates, then he hits a Leaf Blade, which once again could have ended a life with a crit, but it doesn't crit and Sunny survives. The Poke Gods have determined that I am the one that's destined to be the master psychic trainer of Sinnoh, and a second Shadow Ball knocks out Gallade. All jokes aside, one of these days I promise I'm going to play around critical hits better. Last is Alakazam, but Sunny outspeeds, and a final Shadow Ball earns us the win. Now that I'm the best Psychic Trainer in Sinnoh, and I've defeated all four Elite Four members, I guess there's nothing left to do except end the video now. Oh, there's one more battle? Yeah, I guess I'll stick around for a bit longer then. I have one final task ahead of me prove my strength to Cynthia in hopes of demonstrating my value to her. She leads with a Spiritomb, which has three moves that are super effective against everyone on the team, with the exception of Brawny. Man, Steel-type Pokemon are awesome. I've replaced Stealth Rock with Light Screen, and after tanking a Dark Pulse, I set up Light Screen that will now last eight turns instead of five thanks to the Light Clay. After another Dark Pulse hits, Brawny does what they always do, land a Hypnosis in one try. While Spiritomb is asleep, I set up Reflect. Then I swap to Sunny and Spiritomb stays asleep. Shadow Ball does over half, and, you guessed it, Spiritomb doesn't wake up. After knocking it out with a second Shadow Ball, Lucario comes in, so I swap to Gavin on a Shadow Ball, which unfortunately gets a special defense drop. Thanks to Light Screen and Gavin's massive special defense, he can tank another, then KO with an Earthquake. Then our Light Screen wears off. Togekiss comes in next, so I switch back into Brawny on the Air Slash so I can set up another Light Screen. 
Before I can do that, Aura Sphere takes Brawny to just 42 HP, then Reflect wears off. I have to have Reflect up to deal with her Garchomp, so I risk a crit and Aura Sphere brings Brawny to 24 HP, and then I get Reflect up. I send out Marianne, who easily tanks an Aura Sphere, then a Thunderbolt does just over half to Togekiss and gets the Paralysis. Unfortunately, Togekiss doesn't get fully paralyzed, but Light Screen allows Marianne to easily tank an Air Slash, then finish off Togekiss with a second Thunderbolt. Cynthia then sends in her biggest threat, Garchomp. I send in Lisa, who is able to tank a Dragon Rush. According to my calcs, she can survive two non-critical hits from either Dragon Rush or Earthquake. Garchomp goes for Earthquake, and Lisa survives with just 9 HP. Then a 4x super effective Ice Punch gets the KO. My Lodic comes out, and the correct strategy here is to sacrifice Lisa and get a safe switch into Gavin. But I'm so close to the Deathless run, and her only other Pokemon is Roserade, which can easily be taken out by basically anyone on the team in one hit, aside from Brawny. I do some calcs, and knowing that I have one more turn of Light Screen, I realize I can switch into Gavin safely. I send him in, and she goes for Dragon Pulse, which is the weakest choice she could have made. Leaf Blade isn't quite a one-hit KO, and Light Screen faded so I go for Drain Punch to make sure that Gavin can survive a hit from Surf. He lives with just 32 HP after Drain Punch healed him for 33, then a Leaf Blade is able to get the KO from there. Roserade comes in, and I was so excited I didn't check to see if Gavin gets outsped or not, so I just swapped to Sunny to be safe, and a critical hit Sludge Bomb definitely would have knocked him out, so I almost fumbled the bag at the last moment. Fortunately, Sunny proves once again that the Elite Four is his domain, and he lands one final Psychic for the win. When I started this run, I knew there would be a lot of points where my team felt a little too strong, as Psychic-type Pokemon are generally very good, especially the ones available here. I didn't expect a Deathless run, though. There were a lot of points where that certainly could have ended, but with some good luck, or in some cases, avoiding bad luck, the team managed to stay alive all the way to the end. Even though I managed to get through Deathless, this run definitely had its challenging moments and fights that required a lot of planning. It was definitely a lot of fun. If you've made it this far, I just want to say thank you. It means a lot that you stuck around to the end to see how this all played out. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like, and if you want to see more content like this, be sure to subscribe to the channel. It's about time for me to head out. Thanks for watching, and I'll smell you later.